write the words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I guess if we had a two overarching questions, especially as we're talking about the topic of, of the gospel, that would be, I, I would say in some ways, we hope you will answer with great clarity by the end of this course. Two, two questions would be this. How are you going to initiate people into faith? I want to write these down. How are you going to initiate people into faith, into the faith? Walking with Jesus. How are they? What is going to be your method, process? How are you going to communicate that? And secondly, then once that is a reality, how are you going to help them become like Jesus? I would say if it, th those two questions encompass so much of what this whole class is about, how how do we help people into the faith of following Jesus as a disciple? And then how, how are you going to help them become like Jesus in character and action? Now, um, this past year, I was uh, getting gas at a gas station. And um, a big, burly construction guy pulled up in front of me with his truck, with all his gear on his truck, and got out of the, got out of the, uh, got out of the truck and, and came over to me and gave me, uh, gave me a, little dollar bill. It looked like this. It was he said, here's an Obama buck for you. Okay? That's what he gave me. And um, on, this, on, the front end, on the front part of this Obama buck was this gal, kind of Madonna looking like a car cartoon. Beautiful woman looking, smiling at me, alluringly, you know, on this dollar bill. You know? And then you turn it over, and as soon as I turn it over, I realize I got my track here. And uh, then he started talking to me about, about Jesus. I said, you know, hey, I, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus. In fact, I'm a, I'm a pastor. And you know what? It, he didn't skip a beat. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. He just had, he, he had, he had to keep going. You know, he had to, it was, it was, it really didn't affect him at all. But, but you know, in, in spite of the reality that much of our culture now is, you know, like you were saying, Tom, about kids are taught they're good and all of that. This, this default gospel on the right. Now, again, we have folks in this room that that's, that's not your paradigm. How, but, but let me just ask you, how many of you are, have come to faith, came to faith in your life through the gospel of the right? Raise your hand. Just curious. Okay? All right. Now, how many of you did not come to, to the faith in that way? Okay, all right, because the reality is more conservative evangelicalism is, a, is pretty much stuck in the gospel of the right. If you're a mainline church, that's not your gospel. You don't, you don't bring people in through that means. Personal decision is, is really the avenue of the gospel of the right. We think that is the way people come into faith through personal decision. If you're a mainliner, Mainline church. Mainline church relies on socialization. Basically, you, you're not going to see an altar call or the sinner's prayer transacted in a mainline church. You just not. It's just not going to be. You you will the, the, because why? The philosophy generally is, hang around us long enough, and you will catch the virus of following Christ. Isn't that right? You just, just hang on. Be, be among us. You'll get the love of Christ. You will, you will get what we are, and you will soon be one of us. That's the, that's the methodology on, in, in a main line. This is, uh, I'll talk more of this in a, next week, but Scott McKnight did a study on this in his book, Turning to Jesus. Uh, uh, it's, it's on conversion, and he talks about the three branches of Christianity, evangelicalism, mainline church, and then Roman Catholic Orthodox, and they all have different ways that people are initiated into faith. Many of us in this room are from the evangelical side, and this is perfect. This is what, in some form or another, I mean, extreme forms or softer forms, this is the default that most churches use. Whether it's the transaction is through an altar call or the sinner's prayer, so there's, there is something in that transaction that many people end up going to. But look at this. This is a, an answer to Tom. The methodology is masterful because even though people may think they're good, listen, you're not going to think you're very good after this here, okay? 
It says, this is the million dollar, my million dollars here with this woman kind of, kind of uh, looking at me, trying to allure me in. And it says, the million dollar question, will you go to heaven when you die? That's right up front. Of course, in this gospel is more, most concerned with the afterlife, not the present life. Realize that that appeal most oftentimes is not a present life issue. It's about what happens when you die. So that's right up front. What ha- Will you go to heaven when you die? Here's a quick test. Here's the test. Have you to- ever told a lie, stolen anything, or used God's name in vain? So you see, that's a good appeal to start, isn't it, though, Tom? Now, hey, I've told a lie. I may- Maybe I'm not that good. Maybe I'm not that good, right? I mean, it starts going, right? Have you ever told a lie, used God's name in vain, stolen anything? Um, Jesus said, and then here he goes. Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in her heart. He set me up. He's got me now. He put a beautiful woman on there, making, trying to lure me to lust. Right there, he's got me set. Ad- uh, have you ever, yeah, already committed adultery. Have you ever looked with lust? Will, will you be guilty on judgment day? If you have done those things, God sees you as a lying, thieving, blasphemous adulterer at heart. So much for God loves you, right? I mean, you see, that's the problem with this. It's so paradoxical. We say on the one hand, God loves you and wants you, but, but, he real, but what he really thinks is you're an adulterer, you're a sinner, bla- blasphemous, even, and, and besides, if you don't accept me, you get to go to hell. See that paradoxical kind of stuff that goes with this? I mean, convoluted kind of thinking. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, what was, what, was, what was I wearing that day? I don't know. I wonder. Uh, if you've done those things, God sees yes, God sees you that way. And, you, and the Bible warns that, if, that you are guilty and you will end up in, in hell. God, who, who the Bible says is rich in mercy, sent his son to suffer and die on the cross for guilty sinners. Now, there we go. There's the, there's the gospel. That, it's a, a theory of the atonement becomes the gospel. Penal substitutionary atonement becomes the gospel that we have, we have, we have owned here. Jesus paid our fine. That means he can legally dismiss our case. Right? He can commute our death sentence for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then he rose from the dead and defeated death. Please repent. Repent here. Now, again, it's a, it's a total misunderstanding of the word repent. Repent here just means turn from your sin in that context. Not quite the re- w- really what that means, but that's what we have. Repent today, and God will grant everlasting life to all who trust Jesus. Then read your Bible and daily obey it. Okay? Now, what was missing in that at all? Was there anything? I mean, a- as in our discussion, what's the major piece that's absolutely missing? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, it, it really has nothing about being a disciple of Jesus in it at all. And what, what you do after, it's, it's really, let's get the transaction done so, the, so my eternal destiny in heaven gets changed. It has nothing to do with my present life. Nothing. Now, back to Josh, because, you know, this is a perversion of, of that, obviously. So I thought your question was really good, though, Josh, because we're, we're not saying that, that God can't use any of these. In fact, we're, we're, we're a product, many of us in this room are a product of number one, right? And, and, but the testimony is not that, that that gospel was so great and right. The testimony is that God can take that, even that misguided message of the gospel and still, by the Spirit of God, take us down the road in a beautiful way. But does that mean that we continue to pervade that gospel? Well, you know, in, in, at my school down the road, we, many of the denominations and traditions that I have that, that come to be trained to be pastors uh, are totally number one. I mean, that's where they live. And, and it's for them to, to have to make some shifts in some of this. They'll say, well, what do I do? What do I, do? I still do an altar call. I say, you know, hey, I'm not saying to abandon your altar call. But just you, you just have to, you have to in some ways give some further augmentation. I'll say... 
I'll say, this is, this is the one thing I would ask you to do if you want to use an altar call. That, that, that can be a helpful entrance in, but here's where you're going to be dead in the water. When your altar call becomes a finish line, not a starting line. You know what I mean? When, when the transactional sinner's prayer becomes a done deal and not a step into discipleship. And those things. So, so all I guess what I'm saying is these are not. You're, you're, I'm with you. There's truth in them, but but we have done some things with them. If we're not, if we don't use them rightly, we actually make it really hard to come back later and say, "Let's become a disciple of Jesus." We are we are kind of dabbling at the center of the bullseye for people's faith here. This is very precious to many people. The, these methodologies they are deep deep and, and strong. And, um, you know, so I guess we, we have to really work through what, what are people responding to. But the bottom line is, is none of these in, our, their, in its purest form makes a disciple. That's what we're trying to get at. It doesn't now, do that. Are you you're willing to make the statement that you could accept any one of those and still not be saved? you know of anyone who has accepted number one and isn't saved. Uh, by saying that, I'm putting pr- intentional pressure on the word saved. Okay, hmm. So we have to come back to that. Yes. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid there are a lot of people who have accepted number one that are going to be surprised where they wind up. Now, see, that's, that's scary. Uh, but uh, you see, that gets into deeper issues we have to dis- talk about the difference between believing and professing to believe. Yes. Okay. Because what happens with number one is many people are taught to profess to believe something they don't actually believe. Here's, a, here's one of the uh, verses in the Bible I'm sure glad I didn't write. Okay. <laughs> Listen to this. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's 1 John 2, 4. Now, what are you going to do with that? Well, of course, if you're an Arminian, solid, you can live with it. Because you're kind of in and out anyway, probably. Uh, But, uh, uh, and I'm not scorning that, by the way, please. But, see, that's the question you want to ask of each of these. You want to say, I believe you can come to God from any any one of those three. I I think you can. But, see, I don't believe you have to be right in order to be saved. And that's where, see, our culture has this atmosphere of contempt you're identifying. See, that comes out of a past that has identified being right with being saved. And that's why the, you know, you you can just feel the anger and the contempt between these. Is because they, they, they think you couldn't possibly be right. And so you couldn't possibly be saved. But, but what we want to get over to is at some point the good news is the present availability of the kingdom of God found through becoming a disciple of Jesus. Not just, in our context, either becoming a Christian, a member, all those kind of things, which, which, we, which we really haven't clarified well. So, um, all right. Well, very good. Back, back to you, Dallas. Okay. So, uh, this is a wonderful discussion now, and, and I do want every, everyone to understand that I... I do not want to say uh, this is all wrong and I'm not trying to be clever and find objections to things. Uh, The center of my hope is that we can come to understand uh, a message that allows us to become disciples. And... uh, now, you have these other questions that you always come up in these discussions. Can you be saved and not a disciple? Right. So that word saved floats around. 
And it really does touch on what are we offering people? Are we selling salvation? In what sense salvation? And so on. So um, I do want to just emphasize that people come to God in all kinds of ways. All kinds of ways. And uh, that's because it's God who is operating the fishing line. You know, and he knows how to bring people in. And he knows what's in people's hearts. And it's very important to understand that. And uh, when you do, then things like, why did Jesus speak in parables? Right? And you look at his explanation in Matthew 13, and you, you have to think, what? Because he seems to be saying that he speaks in parables so that people can hear and not be converted. What kind of a deal is that? See? And you say, well, he doesn't want anyone to be converted who doesn't want to be converted. I mean, if the problem was conversion, he could snap his cosmic finger and everyone would be converted. So that's where our understanding needs to grow a bit as to how this all works. Now, the old church thought that they had the stuff that would save you. And you accessed that stuff through participating in the sacraments. And uh, that, is, uh, that has turned, turned out to have many, many wonderful benefits. For example, in the rise of modern thought in Europe, one of the patterns was the church said, look, you can doubt anything as long as you come to Mass and as long as you receive the sacraments. You can have any kind of doubt you want. And that enabled it to negotiate a passage through a, a very difficult time. I'm not trying to say this was good or right, but you, you have to recognize that that's how they worked it. Now then, when you come to the Reformation and its outworkings, that's no longer the official deal. The official deal there is you have to have the right beliefs. So the problem, as it works out historically in Northern Europe and in the Americas, North America, is different. And that's a part of where we now have over 40,000 Christian denominations. Over 40,000. And you know what? All of them are right. Why should you become a four-square gospel? I'm trying to pick one. I don't think anyone is here. <laughs> well, because they're right. Isn't that so? Why should you belong to that particular church? Well, they're right. Would you attend a church that wasn't right? For goodness sakes. See. And of course, that sets up dreadful consequences. It's like a man who says, the reason I married my wife is she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Well, pity for her and him. The consequences of that sort of thing are deadly, just deadly. And, uh, but that's what we're locked into now. And so what, see, what I'm hoping for, uh, Keith and me are going to work through stuff here, is that you're going to find your way into a good news that you can communicate to people. And we're going to talk about that. Because this stuff isn't any good if you can't preach it. But how do you preach the fourth gospel? How do you do that? We have to work through that. Because it all comes out one-on-one -on -one with a, an individual. And they are disciples. And they're making disciples. The gentle art of disciple making is what we have to talk about now before we're out of here. <laughs> okay. 
because that's what we're that's what we're about, and we're in a we're in a situation where we can't presuppose that people even understand what that means. But they're there, and we're there to serve them, to love them, to help them. And one of the things we can do is to be with them and teach them in such a way that at some point they either say, you know, I want to become a disciple of Jesus. Or maybe it slips up on them and they look back one day and say, you know, I, I've actually become a disciple of Jesus. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You don't have to know when you were born to know that you were born. And so this is something that, of course, we, we're going to, if we do this, it's only going to be because we are walking gently with Christ and his spirit and his word. But see, we don't want that to dissipate now to where we don't know what to do. We can lead people into discipleship. And the only reason I have for discussing these, and see, these are rich traditions within the Christian movement. They are. And again, all you have to do is just look at the facts and you'll see it. I love thy church, O oh Lord. The place of thy abode. You see, you can just jump on over that like a, like a hawk on a bug and tear it to pieces. Yeah, but wait a moment. What has actually happened there? Okay, you couldn't recommend it. I couldn't, actually. But I want to be able to do justice to what it is and what it does. And a really major point there is to believe that you don't have to be right to be saved, whatever you mean by being saved. Now, if you're wrong enough, it'll block you. But the other side of that is if you can't be right enough that it automatically happens. <laughs> and we are heirs of a tradition, the Reformation tradition, basically. It has some subheadings under there. Uh, like revivalism and so on. We are heirs uh, of a tradition that we have to come to grips with now because we're alive now. And we don't want to lose sight of the marvelous history of the church, of the people of Christ, and what it has been and what it's done and what it's doing now, you see. We're part of that. That's incredible power of God in human history. So, uh, now, this thing that Keith has given us is wonderful, and in your, in your uh, notebook on page 21, I have uh, a little artifact that I picked up in a Lifeway store, if you know what that is. Um, actually, I've got, it looks like just one side, this is two sides of a little laminated card and uh, I've written at the top the default gospel on the right. And now this is illustrated beautifully by what Keith has given. So I won't need to spend a lot of time on you. I just, you just look at it and say, uh, why, how does this set up the issues? How does this set up the issues? And of course, as you expect, I mean, this first, first line, if you were to die, would you go to heaven? Uh, now, that's a really heavy question. And there are a lot of people that are concerned about that. And they don't know what to do about it. And we need to be able to help them. But we need to stay out of an answer to the question that will, as Keith so put it, well put it, uh, an answer that makes that the finish line and not the starting line. Of course, in the grace of God, it's never the starting line anyway, but it's taken as the finish line by people. And it does finish something. 
there is a real transition. No question about it. But our issue in ministry and spirituality is what's the larger picture? What's it a part of? So then you have a, a set of sub-questions and uh, you can look at how they're handled there. I don't sense Keith has given us this uh, other presentation. I don't think we need to go over that, but if you look over it and you want to discuss it later, then you can certainly come back to it. And that's true of anything we're talking about, by the way. So sometimes we say stuff that you need to sit on for three or four days before you come back with a comment or a question. And that's always open. So please understand that. But right now, let's go to the bottom of page 20 and, and finish up with that number four. So what's the good news? The good news is that Jesus is available. Okay, now, you can start. You don't need to start there because how you start depends on the context. And if you look at the sermons that show up in the book of Acts at Lystra, at Athens, and so on, you'll see... Uh, interestingly different starting points. And when Paul is preaching in a synagogue, he doesn't start in the same place where he starts if he's speaking in an agora uh, in one of the Greek cities. So you have to think about where you start, uh, but you need to lead around to Jesus. Now, I would encourage you not to start with Jesus the sacrifice unless you've already got someone who's just seen the passion and they want to talk about it. Well, then you talk about it. That's good. So you have to pay attention to individuals, uh, but basically you want to bring people around to, to Jesus and get them to looking at him and thinking about him. And, uh, for example, I will often say to a person, do you know anything about Jesus? Uh, and very often they don't know anything about anything that was really deeply, uh, deeply involving the larger picture of the kingdom of God and so on. So uh, I think that one of the first things that we might do is to help people know something about Jesus. Now, interestingly enough, that's often very important for our, our church folks. And I think that the primary field for discipleship evangelism is in our churches. We've got a lot of people uh, who are discouraged and disheartened, and they're hanging on, and a lot of them have already bailed out, uh, given up, because they've listened for a long time and not heard anything that they could tie on to. Uh, so we, I think, should make sure that our people in our churches know something about Jesus. And um, the more they know, the better. But in any case, that's, I believe, the way we primarily bear witness. Now, of course, that's the larger picture. So when you come to the end of the Gospel of Luke and you're told to stay in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high, and then Luke continues in Acts chapter 1 and talks about you'll be my witnesses. After the Spirit has come upon you, you're going to be my witnesses. Worldwide. Uh, so uh, we witness to him. And uh, being a pastor or a teacher... You, you will be given an incredible amount of wisdom as to how to do that. But you have to understand that's what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, as you do that, you're going to watch people then say, what am I going to do about this? And how can I know him? And then you help them understand what a disciple is. 
and let them move with that. And you encourage them to believe that they can be his disciples and that this is something that will move out into their whole life. And occasionally we want to uh, ask them questions or lead them in such a way that they could actually make a decision to be a disciple. Now, I really think that that isn't the only way to become a disciple, but probably it's one of the better ways, and we need to think about that when we look at what Jesus said when he said, as you go, make disciples. That's something we do. What is it? Well, baptism would be something that comes down the line a little way. Uh, I don't think that the decision to be a disciple is the same as the decision to be baptized. I would think that ideally it would express a decision uh, and given an appropriate context would be quite meaningful. Uh, now, I actually think that when we baptize someone, we should intend, at least, that they be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But I don't think you have to be baptized in order to become a disciple. And then the meaning of it will vary on the t in depending on the teaching you have about it. If you think that the water actually washes away your sins, well, you know, I would want to talk with the person about that at some length. Right? Uh, I don't think that that's the function of the water in baptism. So uh, you're not going to find this a very satisfactory response, I'm afraid, but I think you just have to look into what baptism means for the individual. And you have to recognize that you can have baptism and nothing happens except somebody got wet. But if you decide to become a disciple, I'm, I will suggest to you that you are deciding to learn from Jesus, you're his disciple, how to live in the kingdom of God as he would live your life in the kingdom of God if he were you. That's what you're learning. You're learning how to live in the kingdom of God as a disciple. That's a status. The process that then begins is spiritual formation, as we call it now. Other ways of talking about it say it's growth in grace. Grace takes more and more of your life, or the spirit occupies more and more of your life. So becoming a disciple is to assume a status. And you, you need to help people understand what that is. They don't understand it especially in the current context where there's a lot of confusion about the, what is the difference between becoming a Christian and becoming a disciple. Now, you're going to have to work on that because a lot of the folks that you're going to have to help become disciples are already Christians. And when they begin to put that together, they're probably going to, going to be confused about what's going on. If you were going to make a disciple, what would you be trying to do? Could someone tell whether or not they were a disciple of Jesus in his day? What was being a disciple in that day? See? Now the thing is, being a disciple isn't an advanced spiritual condition. You can be a disciple and be as green as a gourd, <laughs> spiritually. So now try this on. Okay, and as I've said, you, can, you don't have to believe anything I say to you, okay? Disciple is a status. Other translations will help you. Student is a perfectly legitimate translation of the word we translate as a student. That's what a disciple was. These guys were students, and gals were students of Jesus. Now, when you become a student of algebra, you may not know A squared from B plus, but you're a student. How did you get to be a student? You signed up. You signed up. Now, you walk up to someone at the, on the streets and say, hey, I'm going to teach you algebra. 
what would be the response? Well, I'm not your student, right? Now, if, if you're going to a school and you come into a room and you paid some money and signed some papers and now I walk in the room and say, now I'm going to teach you algebra. Different response. Now, something has to happen before you sign up with Jesus, right? But then you have to consider, what are you signing up for? And to be a disciple of Jesus is to sign up as a student, or I like the word apprentice, because of its applied sense. And then you watch what Jesus actually did with the people who were his disciples. And how he said things like, you know, if you don't abandon everything you've got, including your own life, you can't be my disciple. What's he saying? So you have to do the textual work around disciple in the New Testament. And then you realize, boy, you can be a very, you're a very ignorant disciple. And you can be asking all the dumb questions that they ask including right up to the last. Lord, at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Well, he had heard that so many times. You know. And he understood that that was just a dumb thing they had in their head. And that he couldn't do anything about it beyond just say, well, you know, it's, it's not for you to know. It's not, none of your business. And then he got on to what was their business. Right? As I said yesterday, power without position. They didn't know what that was. See, that's what they had to learn. And they did learn, slowly, but they got it. And, you know, we're still working on that, folks. The meaning of history is not something that you can just wave your hand at it. We're still working on it. See, and... Uh, so many of the issues we're still working on, those are kingdom issues. You know, that person, I mean, we hear so much of this, I hate to even say it, but you know, these discrimination issues are neighbor issues. They're not discrimination issues. They're neighbor issues. If you owe something to a person, it's not because they have a certain gender or a certain color, it's because they're your neighbor. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, that's going to take care of all the issues. Eventually, you'll have to work it out. Because, for example, in the South, 75 years ago, many people treated those of a different color, white or black, as their neighbor and loved them. Meantime, like my Aunt Jessie, when she heard that you could actually transfer blood from a black person to a white person, she just dissolved. But I had seen her deal with black persons. That doesn't make it right. It's just, that's, see, that, that's discipleship has a multi-generational meaning as well as within the individual. So you can have someone singing Deutschland über alles. And they are warm-hearted Christians by that understanding. But they got a lot to learn as a disciple, haven't they? So now, so these are excellent things we have to come to grips with. And we, we have to have an understanding of who a disciple is, if we're going to make a disciple. Is that right? I mean, it could happen. The Lord could make it happen and so on, but we have the command, make disciples. That's something for us to do. So, now, 
I am really hoping that as we go out of here, if you don't already know how to deal with that and you have a satisfactory, that you will have a satisfactory way of doing that. And you can set out to make disciples very consciously. That's what I'm hoping. Jesus comes along. Now, there's no doubt that they knew Jesus before that. I mean, those, those communities, everyone knew everyone. And he says, no, fellows, uh, follow me. They knew what that meant. That the structure of rabbi and disciple was a familiar structure. And so they go. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. And fishing is probably one of the best metaphors for making disciples you can find. Uh, because fish really are pretty smart and they have a way. And uh, so it's, it's illustrative. So they understood. Or later when a couple of them, John the Baptist says, that's the one. And they say, okay. And so they follow him around a bit, and he notices them and says, uh, what do you guys want to know? And they give one of those classic dumb answers. Oh, where do you, where do you live? Oh, gee, they, were, they had been sitting up the night before arguing about where he lived. No, I mean, well, Jesus says, come and see. It's okay. And they do. And they become disciples. And it is helpful to look at what that meant in the original context and to realize it was an institutional reality. It was not like saying to someone today, uh, follow me. You say that to someone today, uh, well, I don't know what it will mean to them. Probably not a lot. Uh, so we want to work on that and our present project is to try to clear this up a bit. Right? And to say, now, if you go at this in some ways, it just doesn't follow that you're going to make disciples. You could. It has happened. But see, one of the things you have to get used to in following Christ is the mere fact that God blesses something doesn't mean it's what he had in mind. The real substance here is that we're counting on the blessing. We count on God moving in their lives. So we're now out of the position of having to manipulate them. Now we pay attention to them and we respond to questions and comments and problems. Uh, we pray, pray, pray with them. Uh, we associate with them, which is one of the things that was a large part of Jesus' ministry. And for which <coughs> he got a lot of criticism was because he associated with people uh, that uh, the Pharisees didn't think he should be associating with. And so a picture in the gospel is he's here having a nice time with a bunch of Republicans and sinners and the Pharisees are over here grumbling. That grumbling shows up a lot. And it's usually the Pharisee that is grumbling. Jesus wasn't grumbling. Actually, it's hard to find a place where he grumbled. So, now, you know, I don't think you can reduce this to a formula. But we ought to have in our minds... What is a disciple? And some idea of how we're working with God to help people become disciples. And we can do that. And I, I do think one of the most beautiful places is where we're helping children become disciples. It makes a lot of sense to them. And they can easily move into it. Well, uh, 
on page 26, I have a diagram that I try to use to help clarify um, the contrast between conservative or sin management, conservative sin management gospels. And of course, those gospels are less about sin itself than about guilt. And um, then the gospels of the left tend to be about sin itself, but not sin any particular person commits. It's usually a corporate sort of thing and uh, things that need to be changed. So I have here conservative sin management gospel, faith, down here, halfway down on the left-hand side, faith, believing the right things about Jesus. That is identified with faith. And that secures heaven after death. And uh, the way I present it here, and it always needs qualification, is there's no real connection with discipleship special religious, religious efforts, they're nice but not necessary. And we're glad to see someone do something special, but it's not expected. And then down on the right-hand side, ordinary life, work, play, family, community, one is supposed to be Christ-like or at least to do right. But again, it's not necessary. And for many people, they think it is not possible we have a whole segment now of the uh, conservative church that thinks brokenness is the ultimate position in the spiritual life. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, but in any case, there's no natural bridge from faith to obedience and abundance. No natural connection. Some people make it, but very few actually. Uh, and into that uh, can step prosperity gospels, but they don't do a big deal usually about obedience, it's about abundance. And I think that we need to associate those and not really think about one without the other. Um, another thing we'll look at is how obedience does have a natural connection with abundance. They're not the same, uh, but the obedient Christian usually is well provided for, and that's what Jesus said. Uh, so we don't need to be anxious about provisions, but uh, we may not be driving a Peugeot or an Audi or something of that sort. Well, do we really need that? If we really need to be driving a Peugeot or a Mercedes or whatever, then we have a spiritual problem that we need to deal with. On the other hand, if we don't have a spiritual problem, it's perfectly all right to drive a Peugeot. As long as you don't think that's blessedness. If you think that's blessedness, you've got a problem. Now then, the bottom here, I put Jesus' gospel of kingdom life from above now. Faith here is confidence in Jesus and his present kingdom. It, that's otherwise known as trust. Trust. And then I see my whole life as the place of redemption. It is the place of interactive relationship with God. And we're going to say a lot about that next week because I will want to be hammering on you about where is discipleship. And the main place where discipleship is exercised is work, not at church. I hope the people at church will exercise discipleship. But I shall be saying to you that the church is for discipleship and discipleship is for the world because that's where God is. And then discipleship, uh, learning from him how to lead my life as he would lead it if he were I. So that's a different picture than 
of uh, the gospel number four from gospel number one. And what I'm saying here is the gospels of the right and of the left uh, deal with personal sins, usually guilt, uh, but also sin. The older people understood that. Um, the old hymn, Rock of Ages, be of sin the double cure. What's the double cure? Save from wrath and make me pure. That's the understanding that people who wrote old praise songs uh, included. Um, so obsession with these personal sins and structural evils does not lead to personal transformation. Now that's a statement and you can reject it and do whatever you want to with it. I think it's true. It is not a basis for apprenticeship to Jesus. What is the positive direction and intention that would also deal with them? Well, that's where we have to have a different understanding of grace. And now I want to put this before you. Grace is God acting in our lives to accomplish what we are incapable of on our own. That's what grace is. There's no necessary connection to sin. Grace is tied to life. Because it's tied to life, it has to deal with sin. The grace is what we are meant to live on. And I think this is what you would get if you did inductive Bible study of the term grace. And uh, some of the past students in this group have done that and um, turned out documents where they list all the occurrences of grace and uh, Old Testament and New Testament. If we had never sinned, we would still need grace. Because grace is about life. If Adam and Eve were actually going to take charge of the fish and the creeping things, they would need a lot of help. <coughs> and they, they were meant to live by the grace of God pre-fall or pre-jump. Grace is what we're meant to live by. We have a system that won't work without it. Simply won't work without it. The human mind is a system that will not work right unless it is inhabited and pervaded by the truth about God which is revealed in Scripture. This truth and the corresponding reality has to be held there by grace. And by choice, they go together. They don't exclude one another. Peace, joy, and then love are the automatic progression of the individual soul. So I'll give you a couple of verses here. I've already cited one of them at least. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. And then I love Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, those are natural conditions of the one who is living in harmony, their whole system with the kingdom of God. And that is why the mind of the Spirit is peace, life and peace because it's looking to the kingdom of God and God the king as what guides it and gives it strength uh, and of course the scripture and hopefully the teaching of the people of Christ are in the middle of that. So uh, on your note page there, 22, the difference between trusting Christ and trusting his death for your sins. Uh, and this is something I know that you want to work on and you want to say, is it really true that those are not the same thing and so forth, and yet you need to do that. So to trust Christ is to believe that he is right about everything. 
that he is completely reliable and in charge. So when he says, I've been given say over everything, that's his resources. And when he says, I'm with you every moment till the deal is done, well, that's where his resources come to bear. So he is the only proper center for human life and history. So when you go to uh, witness to someone, you might say, How, you know, aren't you worried about missing out on the most important thing that's happening in your world? No. Sometimes you might want to say, if you die tonight, what's going to happen to you? But you can try. If you don't die, deny what's going to happen to you. Yeah. Try that one. What's going to happen to you? What's going to happen? You, you miss out on the most important thing that's happening in your life. What's that? That's what Jesus Christ is doing in this world now. And you're out there trying to make your little, strutting around, trying to make your little kingdom the ultimate point of reference. Probably don't want to put it just like that, but maybe it'll come to them. <laughs> you know. I, try that. I, I think it's a very good starting the conversation. What's going to happen to you if you don't die tonight? The good news is that he invites us to trust him and to go into business totally with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on a whole life basis, renewing and fulfilling the creation covenant of Genesis 1 through the birth from above. This is the life of grace. What do you think? Is that good news? I'll tell you. I've never heard anything that comes close. Now then, you escape this idea that there is such a thing as part-time Christian service. And I refer you here to William Law. I hope you had a chance to read him. Of course, The Imitation of Christ, Brother Lawrence. What do they have in common? They all insist. Like Law starts out and says, give me a reason why you should be pious when you pray. Right? And I'll give you a reason why you should be pious of everything you do. The idea of Suddenly, when you go to pray, you shift into gear now, and you're going to be pious. It's stupid, right? And Law is a wonderful writer who helps us begin to see all of this. And um, so, and of course, Thomas Akempis the same way, you know. That first section in Kempis, and later on, uh, he talks about starts starts that book out. I mean, it hit me like a blow in the forehead. I picked that book up in a used bookshop in Chattanooga and read the first line, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Wow. And then old Brother Lawrence, practicing the presence of God, see. That, and he didn't originate that. Actually, it came out of uh, one of the other books that I think is on your list um, by Francis de Sales, Introduction to the Devout Life. He's the one who picked it up. Jeremy Taylor got it after he did, and then Brother Lawrence. But actually, it's the history of the church. So now... That's where we need to go back to the gospel and the world of the spirit. He that abideth in the secret place of the Most High shall dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. Where is the secret place of the Most High? It's wherever you are. That's wherever you are, because the connection you have and that you stand in is secret. No one can see it. They can see the outcome. Jesus picks that same theme up, of course, in Matthew 6. When you pray, enter into your closet. 
Now, I've known people who actually used a closet that way, but it doesn't exactly mean that. But it, that do, and probably. But the point is, you know, he goes on to say, God who is in secret. I love that passage because it's God who is in secret. What does that mean, is in secret? It means you don't see him, but he's there. If you want him to be there, he'll be there for you. You don't want him, okay, he'll let you have your way. But if you want to, you can deal with God who is in secret. And the results will be something so obvious that everyone has to see it. God who is in secret will reward the openly. And I guarantee you, that's what will happen. Acts uh, 10, 40 and 41 is a fascinating passage on how Jesus uh, dealt with his people after his resurrection. Now, Again, you, you've got to deal with the question, why was that? Acts 10, 40. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should become visible, not to all the people. Why not to all the people? If I had been in his place, I would have loitered around Pilate's house. <laughs> let's see. Could we let's have that talk about truth again, <laughs> or the chief priests? You know, he didn't do that. See, and that's the sort of thing that we need to think about in order to penetrate into his strategy of dealing with people and with human history. Not to all people, but to witnesses who had been chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. You know, some of those guys and gals must have said to him at some point, listen, why don't you uh, show up? Well, actually, he wasn't showing up to them all the time. It was relatively rarely that he showed up to them in a visible form. He was communicating with them through the Holy Spirit, as Acts chapter 1 says. And that's a part of the transition that he's making. He wants a people with whom he can communicate with without being visible. Blessed are they who believe and have not seen. Have you preached on what is that blessing? Don't you think that would be a good text? What is the blessing of believing without seeing? Well, not particularly. The passage uh, there uh, with Thomas doesn't say that they are more blessed than the people who have seen. He just says, you're blessed if you can believe without seeing. Doesn't rule anything else out. But you see, I mean, you have to imagine what your life would be like if you were seeing Jesus all the time. They, they think about that. And probably there, there wouldn't be much left for you. But you're the one that's on the spot. Jesus isn't on the spot. And so it was important for him to arrange for that. Okay, we're out of time, and we'll just have to pick up there and go on the best we can. Okay, so keep your comments and your questions. Your, and uh, really, the hard issues are the ones that are best. So please don't pull any punches, and don't feel sorry for me.